My name is Michelle Stacy, and I teach at Mascuda High School. I have been teaching AP European History for about 13 years, about six years at my current school, and I've also taught AP U.S. History for the past six years, and we just went through the redesign this year. And so there are a lot of insights that I can bring to show some of the overlap between the current redesign for U.S. and then next year's redesign for Euro. So we're going to go ahead and get started and talk uh, first about the historical thinking skills. Uh, the historical thinking skills are discrete skills that are tested on the exam um, in a variety of ways. And these historical thinking skills um, are covered in U.S. history, next year in European history, and then the following year after that in world history. And they focus on things such as chronological reasoning, comparison and contextualization, uh, crafting historical arguments from historical evidence, and using historical interpretation and synthesis. These historical thinking skills are described further on rubrics that we're going to look at. So we'll talk more specifically about these skills a little bit later. So the next aspect of the redesign focuses on thematic learning objectives. And in European history, there are five thematic learning objectives. So the first, as you see, is interaction of Europe and the world. And so that focuses a lot on uh, colonization or imperialism. Uh, the second thematic learning objective focuses on poverty and prosperity. So there are economic and social aspects of poverty and prosperity that are covered in the redesign. The next thematic learning objective is the objective knowledge and subjective visions. This focuses a lot on philosophical, and artistic movements, as well as literature movements. And it explains how different people during different time periods think about the world around them differently. The next thematic learning objective focuses on states and other institutions of power. And so these focus on uh, political aspects and government and the relationship between the government and the people. And then the final thematic learning objective is focused on individual and society. And so the individual and society looks at identity, gender identity, class identity, ethnic identity. And all of these thematic learning objectives are connected to key concepts throughout the framework. So the next thing that we're going to look at briefly is the key concept outline. Um, so if you've had a chance to look at the framework, there are four time periods that are covered in the key concept outline. So the first of these time periods is approximately 1450 to approximately 1648. Uh, the second one of these is approximately 1648 to 1815. The third of these is approximately 1815 to 1914, and then the final time period is 1914 to the present. And each of the key concepts listed throughout these time periods does have a chance of being tested on the exam. And the released APUS exam uh, does go all the way uh, throughout the entire key concept outline. So it is very important for teachers to look carefully at the key concepts to see how they can incorporate those key concepts uh, throughout the course. The key concepts do focus on um, our general themes that we've seen in the past, politics, economics, society, and culture. And they are arranged in similar patterns throughout each time period. So for example, politics typically tends to be uh, the first concept covered in each time period. So in terms of planning for your courses, it's uh, pretty consistent that way. And there's a lot of opportunities for comparison um, and finding patterns throughout these time periods. So that's just a brief overview of the framework itself. 
And some of those ideas do overlap with U.S. history, specifically the historical thinking skills. And so this is a great opportunity to collaborate with other teachers in your school. Previously, we weren't always talking together, but now we're going to be analyzing the same historical thinking skills. So that's a great collaborative opportunity. So next, I wanted to talk to you about the overall test structure and timing. And this, again, is going to be similar with the US history redesign that has just gone through, and then world will be the year after. So if you do have vertical articulation in your schools, your students will be comfortable with this test taking structure as they go throughout their, their years of high school. Um, so each of the tests will be structured the same way. The first part of the exam is the multiple choice, made up of 55 questions. And students will have 55 minutes to answer those questions. All questions are stimulus-based. And a stimulus could be a reading. It could be a primary source. It could be a chart or a graph. It could be a political cartoon. And then they are asked questions based on that stimulus. All questions have four choices per question. Um, previously, it used to be five. They've changed that over the years. And there are typically three to four questions per stimulus. Questions can be focused on contextualization, or sometimes they're connected to comparison with earlier or later time periods or have some connection to periodization. So the multiple choice questions do connect back to historical thinking skills. The second aspect of part one are the short answer questions. And the short answer questions are four questions that students will have 50 minutes to answer. Typically, these short answer questions are three parts. Um, and they are labeled A, B, and C. Students um, need to address all three parts in their response. They do not have to order their response in any way. They don't have to label them A, B, or C. They simply need to directly respond to all three parts. The structure of the short answer has some variety. Um, one common short answer question involves an analysis of two secondary sources about the same topic and students need to support their analysis of those secondary sources with historical evidence. Uh, we will be taking a look at a sample question like that a little bit later. Other short answer questions might be an image or a political cartoon in which uh, students need to analyze what concepts are being represented. So for example, they might see the painting Liberty Leading the People and might uh, need to explain the role of nationalism in this or the role of political participation or the role of social class. Another common short answer question focuses on periodization, in which students will be asked to explain the beginning of something or the turning point of something, uh, for example, industrialization. And then they're provided with three options in which they need to explain which one is the best option, what one does not work as well, and then what historical example can they use to verify their answer. So these short answer questions require students to use historical evidence from a time period to support their answers. And they are given lined paper um, to answer these. And they are not allowed to write outside of the borders of the box. And students are encouraged to write a paragraph to address all three parts of the short answer question. So that covers part one of the exam. Part two of the exam is the essay portion. And the essay portion focuses on the document-based question, the DBQ, and the renamed LEQ. The LEQ used to be referred to as the FRQ, or the free response question. LEQ stands for long essay question. It is called the long essay question because it is longer than the short answer question. So first, we'll talk briefly about the DBQ. 
and then we will go into greater detail in a little bit with the rubric. So first and foremost, the DBQ is written in 55 minutes, five minutes less than it has been in the past. The College Board recommends a 10 to 15 minute prep where they annotate the documents. Uh, the document-based question is now scored out of seven points, whereas it used to be nine points. The document-based question typically has uh, seven documents. The APUS exam that was just released actually only had six. Um, but this is considerably less than what we have been used to seeing in the past because students are now required to use all or all but one of the documents. And the DBQ will be scored using a rubric rather than the core and expanded coring that we have previously used in the past. And again, we will talk more about that rubric in just a moment. The LEQ, or the long essay question, um, there is a one, uh, one choice that they will answer from two options. So this is a change uh, students used to write two FRQs. Now they will write one LEQ. They will have 35 minutes, um, as they have had in the past, and this includes a five-minute preparation. That is also a new scoring standard that is out of six points and that also involves a rubric. So the DBQ rubric covers key points of analysis, and this rubric is also found in the appendix of the framework, and teachers can copy from the framework um, and use that existing rubric, or they can create their own rubric. And what students need to do for this, first and foremost, is that they need to have a thesis statement. As in the past, their thesis statements cannot simply restate the question. It needs to have some kind of analysis. And they can get zero or one point for their thesis. The next component is analysis of historical evidence and support of argument. So students need to use and analyze all or all but one document. And they need to analyze point of view in all or all but one document. Point of view is slightly different from the previous years of European history point of view. Uh, point of view involves um, four options. One of these is the intended audience. So in other words, who is the author trying to speak to? Uh, what is the purpose of the document? So what is the author trying to do with this document? Uh, what is the historical context of this document? Uh, what is going on during this time period that has influenced this author? Or uh, the author's point of view. And this is the traditional way that European history point of view has been focused, um, looking at the profession of the author, gender, social class, things like that. Uh, we will be looking at a uh, sample document and sample point of view analysis for that document. And students can get up to three points for completing all of those requirements. Um, another new aspect for European history is the analysis of outside examples to support the thesis or the argument. Students need to connect each document to a historical example that is not specifically found in the document. For years in the past, the DBQ for European history tended to be a more obscure topic in order to um, focus on how students utilize the documents. In recent years, you may have noticed that the European history DBQ had a more mainstream topic. And that is what we will see moving forward, in which students will be required to use outside knowledge. Outside knowledge typically in the past had been part of the expanded core, but now it will be essential in order to get points. Students will be asked to connect outside historical examples to these documents. Similarly, students will also be uh, tested on contextualization. Students need to um, put this topic into a broader historical context 
Uh, this can be done in the introduction and the conclusion. I have told my students to take a step back in history, what was going on historically right before this topic, and then uh, take a step forward in history, what was going on after this topic. So that helps for contextualization. And then finally, students may earn one point for synthesis. Uh, synthesis involves a sophisticated thesis statement in which the student goes beyond uh, basic thoughts about the topic, but has a, a very detailed thesis statement, or uh, notices varying evidence within the documents, or connects contrasting evidence from outside examples, or connects the topic um, to other topics or time periods or areas. So for example, if the DBQ is about uh, colonization, they connect it to imperialism later um, so that they're drawing on different time periods. Or finally, they may in, in fact utilize historiography in their DBQ if they highlight that this is a Marxist historian, or if they focus on um, interdisciplinary thoughts such as economics or sociology. And so that gives us a broad overview of the rubric for the DBQ. And so uh, we're going to take a look now at the rubric for the LEQ. There are some overlapping concepts here. And so what you will find with your students is, is that um, during the early months as you are uh, beginning your year together, you can focus on some of these ideas. And then uh, students will have um, time to practice them throughout the year. And if you're using a DBQ versus an LEQ, you'll, you'll be able to talk about some of these same things. Um, so for example, the thesis also is very important with the LEQ. Um, you'll need to make sure that your students are focused on a specific thesis that analyzes the question rather than restates it. The key uh, aspect of the rubric here for the LEQ is focusing on the targeted historical thinking skill. So for example, an LEQ could focus on continuity and change over time. You will know the targeted historical thinking skill because the prompt or question will specifically utilize the wording or language in the thinking skill itself. So for example, a continuity and change over time question will specifically ask the students to describe both continuity and change over time regarding a specific topic. Students will need to use specific historical examples to illustrate both continuity and change over time in order to get up to two points for this application. Similarly, if the question is a comparison question, they need to describe similarities and differences, both similarities and differences between time periods. And again, they need specific examples. And they need to analyze why these differences occur. Um, and this is language directly from the rubric in the appendix. And so when these essays are scored, these rubrics will be applied. So this is an important aspect of um, looking at your essays that you have students write throughout the year and utilizing uh, language that reflects this framework to get your students comfortable with that. Uh, causation uh, needs to describe both causes and or effects of a historical development. And again, utilize a specific example that um, illustrate or show or prove cause and effect. Uh, periodization was the targeted historical thinking skill for the US history LEQs this year. Um, so you can go to AP Central and download uh, the 2015 AP US essays. And you can see the wording of these periodization questions. And they are worded exactly as you see here on the screen, in which students needed to analyze the extent to which a historical development was different or similar to uh, the time period both before and after. So the College Board is 
very focused on utilizing the specific language of the targeted historical thinking skill in the prompt itself. And then you will notice, again, synthesis is a point for the LEQ. Once you've worked on that with your students with a DBQ, they can also utilize this in the LEQ. So those are uh, the two rubrics that are primarily going to be used for the essays. So let's move on now to talk more specifically about teaching strategies um, for the upcoming school year. So the short answer question is definitely a change from previous exams. And what I have done throughout this year in my US history class, and what I will definitely do next year with Euro, is I've begun to incorporate the short answer questions into my classes. Um, the short answer question is an excellent opening activity. Um, some teachers call them bell ringers. I refer to them as questions of the day. And so oftentimes, I will spend the first 10 to 12 minutes of class having the students answer a short answer question. So for example, if I want to have them um, look at two contrasting secondary sources, I'll create a handout for that. It's a little hard to read on a screen. So I'll create a handout, hand that out to the students. Um, they will complete uh, parts A, B, and C. And then we'll talk about them as a class and debrief them. Um, other times, I might put an image up on um, my interactive whiteboard or just a regular whiteboard. Um, you could put up an image and have students analyze what concepts are being reflected in this image. Um, or I might just simply have a question um, on a PowerPoint slide that I display on my interactive whiteboard. So for example, that might be um, a periodization question. Uh, which of the following best re reflects the beginning of mass politics in European history? And then have three choices. So the short answers at the beginning of class are a way to get your students to become comfortable answering them. They are a timed situation. Um, they'll have about 12 minutes on the actual exam per short answer. So this can get students um, comfortable in responding to those. I have my students answer them in their notebooks, but you can also print out the actual short answer paper and collect it as a way for students to feel more comfortable. So then let's talk a little bit next about the pacing of the class. For me, in my experience with US history, not much has changed in terms of the overall pacing for me, but I did look carefully at pacing guides that are on AP Central. And it is very important to cover all of the time periods with the key concepts before the exam. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the US exam did specifically go from beginning to end, touching at least briefly on all the time periods. So it is important to chronologically finish um, through the end of the framework. Uh, but I did look, again, at how I spend my time on each unit. So that has changed um, because I did want to focus more directly on the historical thinking skills and the language of those skills. So for example, um, I focused a lot on comparison. I included more comparison review activities during second semester to encourage students to look at um, comparison and contrast and continuity and change over time. As I've mentioned, the colonization imperialism comparison is a very common one. Um, within second semester, 19th century nationalism and 20th century nationalism, or even 21st century nationalism. Um, as we saw with the DBQ for this year's European history exam, it was very current with immigration in France. So looking as much into the present as you can. Um, throughout the year, when I did um, modify activities, I made sure um, that I had more focused discussion questions that were specifically based on those historical thinking skills. Again, using the language of those rubrics and the language of the historical thinking skills helps students become more comfortable with those concepts. 
Um, so I tried to make very explicit connections between time periods um, so that, again, students are thinking comparatively throughout the year. Um, incorporating more secondary sources definitely is important in the redesign. Um, there are those short answer questions with those two sources that are important. Um, so teachers can work to find um, two sources that have contrasting views on the same concept. And it is, uh, it is oftentimes difficult, however, to find some of these sources, as we all know. Um, so a very good secondary source reader is important for the course. And you can definitely find journal articles online using databases such as JSTOR. Uh, JSTOR can be quite expensive, however. And sometimes school librarians are able to get trial periods. Or if you have a university um, nearby, you might be able to get uh, login privileges through the university. So that's just some um, broad ideas about the overall pacing of the class. I'd like to talk to you next about how I revise the test within my classes. So my unit tests are over two days. And this is something that I have done consistently in the past. But now with the short answer question, I have revised the timing of some of my classes. I just want to let you know I am on a 50-minute class period at the school that I'm at. Some of you may be on a block schedule, or you may be on 45 to 47-minute classes. So your timing and structure may vary. However, I do emphasize that I did put at least two short answer questions on every unit test to have the students comfortable answering at least two. Uh, once again, they will answer four on the actual exam, um, but getting them comfortable writing short answer questions throughout the year. So for every unit test, uh, which would be approximately every two weeks or so, um, I would have 20 to 25 multiple choice questions. And those, again, are all stimulus-based questions. So they may have five um, stimuli to look at, and then about four questions per stimulus, uh, depending on how you want to structure that. And then again, two short answer questions on every unit test. And then moving forward to day two, um, on day two of my unit test, um, that is typically when I've had an essay, and this has not changed in the past. Uh, but I do try to get a DBQ written in one class period. So again, I do have a 50-minute class period. Um, they will have five minutes less than when they actually take the exam. Uh, but as we all know, it's better for students to have that practice, seeing everything all at once. And if they have more time, they would just be able to add a little bit more detail. But they uh, typically would write that essay over um, on that second day. And then the LEQ, again, is 35 minutes, as it has always been. So the FRQ and the LEQ are the same. For grading, what I have done is um, I've given them a score out of um, 7 or 6, and then I've converted that to points for my grade book. Um, 50 points is typically what I give for an essay. And um, if we do have questions about grading, those are things I can definitely talk more about um, in a couple of minutes when we have our questions. Uh, so let's take a look now at some sample questions that could appear. So here is a sample multiple choice question. This is a stimulus uh, that is a political cartoon. The Rhodes Colossus is a political cartoon about Cecil Rhodes. So the question asks, which of the following descriptions best describes the motivation reflected in the political cartoon? The wording for each of these four choices directly comes from the framework. And so that's a way for students to um, reflect on key concepts as well as content connected to those key concepts. And so looking at these four choices, um, there are choices that refer to raw materials, nationalism, uh, golden spices, and then the Christian faith. So uh, students should choose A, letter A, for this. Uh, letter A is the correct answer. Um, as the search for raw materials and markets for manufactured goods motivated Europeans such as Cecil Rhodes in his acquisition of diamonds. Uh, letter B 
does focus on strategic and nationalist considerations, which is true for this time period, but these motivations are not directly reflected in the political cartoon. And then for letters C and D, those are both from the uh, 16th century. So those are not accurate from this time period. Um, and so that is uh, one way that you can look at these uh, multiple choice questions. There are distractors that are from the same time period, but are not necessarily the best or the most uh, direct answer. Um, so that would be a sample multiple choice question. So let's take a look now um, at a sample short answer question. And this may be a little difficult to read on the screen. Um, I did want to show you how passages could be utilized. These are two secondary source passages. Both refer to the Reformation. Um, and these are pretty um, significant arguments that students typically are familiar with. Um, the first passage by Ewan Cameron refers to the specific religious motivations for the Reformation. And the second passage refers to political motivations for the Reformation. So letter A asks students to briefly explain one major difference between Cameron's and Elton's interpretations. So students can respond um, that Cameron believed that the Reformation was religiously motivated, whereas Elton believed that the motivations were political. Briefly explain how someone supporting Cameron's interpretation could use one piece of evidence from the period between 1517 and 50, 1555 not directly mentioned in this excerpt. And so students might say um, that Luther's 95 theses would support Cameron's argument because Luther challenged the sale of indulgences in the church. And so students need to explain their example, not just list their example. And then finally, for letter C, uh, students need to briefly explain how someone supporting Elton's interpretation could use one piece of evidence from the period 1517 and 1555 that's not directly mentioned in the excerpt. And again, students could mention, uh, for example, Henry VIII creating the Church of England uh, to solidify a male heir to the throne, um, illustrating po political motivations. So for this short answer question, uh, students need to address all three parts. And it's zero points or one point. So if they explain a difference correctly, that is one point. If they do not explain the difference correctly, it's zero points. They need to explain an accurate, historically relevant example from the time period. If they do not explain it, or if it is not from the time period, they do not get that point. And similar for part C. So the emphasis for your students will be to explain their examples and use um, accurate historical examples from the time period. So that will be something that you'll want to continue to work with your students again to have an explanation and then a specific example from the time period. So next, let's take a look at a sample DBQ prompt. So on the left-hand side, uh, there is a prompt, compare and contrast how European rulers and their subjects viewed the proper role of an absolute monarch in the 16th and 17th centuries. Be sure to account for these similarities and differences. Students need to both compare and contrast and they need to utilize similarities and differences. And I've provided a, a sample document. This was document six. Uh, this is a document from Montesquieu, in which Montesquieu discusses the fact that um, governmental power in one person denies people liberty and creates a tyranny. And so this reflects, of course, uh, Montesquieu's call for a separation of powers. And so if we take a look next at uh, POV analysis, this next slide will show you the new way to interpret uh, POV in this DBQ. So one way that a student can analyze POV for Montesquieu is to talk about the intended audience. 
The intended audience might be Louis XV, who was uh, the monarch at the time. It could be the French subjects. It could be fellow philosophers. So they need to briefly explain who is the intended audience for this document. Uh, they can also talk about the Montesquieu's purpose. Montesquieu wanted to explain how separation of powers prevents tyranny or how a single person causes tyranny. Uh, they can connect this to historical context. Um, so the historical context is uh, a look at French absolutism. So the student might mention how previously Louis XIV never called the Estates General. Uh, Louis XIV acted as a tyrant when he revoked the Edict of Nantes, which had supported toleration. Or the context is other philosophers were also critiquing the absolute monarch's power. Um, and then finally, the author's point of view could be analyzed. Um, so students might talk about the fact that as a philosoph, Montesquieu believed in reason or a rational explanation. So there's ways to think about um, the author's point of view. And so we're going to wrap up by looking at the LEQ. So we can take a look next at a sample LEQ question. So the LEQ, um, this particular LEQ focuses on comparing and contrasting motivations for colonization with motivations for imperialism. And so there's a way to look at both similarities and differences and account for those. And so if we take a look next at some historical examples and the support for the argument, so students need to both compare and contrast. So first we'll look here at comparison. The comparison could be economic motivations. They, they had similar economic motivations. Um, in the 15th and 16th centuries, it was trade routes and spices. And then in the 19th century, the British in particular wanted new resources and economic motivations. Um, and then religious motivations, we saw um, the Treaty of Tordesillas commanding Christian Catholics to go out and convert the masses. And then we also see Christian missionaries focused on conversion. So that's something to think about for comparison. And so if we take a look at contrast, um, they also do need to have support for argument in terms of contrasting. And so they can have contrasting versions of analysis here. You have differing cultural views. Um, the individualism of the Renaissance inspired people to think about the world around them. Uh, but in the 19th century, we see the development of social Darwinism that encouraged imperialism rather than colonization. Um, this direct imperial control because native populations could not govern themselves. So there's a difference there that students can address. And then finally, they could have differing political motivations. And so um, politically, um, there was glory in the 16th century, but more direct nationalism in the 19th century. Um, and so those would be some explanations for differing political motivations. And then finally, just to take a look at synthesis. So synthesis is, again, something that's new. So this is um, an explanation directly from the, the framework. Um, so students can earn a synthesis point by connecting the essay to other time periods or um, things like that. So I threw out some examples here. So connecting the impact of exploration to the rise of absolutism and mercantilism, so maybe mentioning those things. Um, and then connecting um, exploration to the development of capitalism or describing the connection of imperialism to nationalism in World War I. So some of those aspects in the conclusion can be very, very helpful. And so that's an overview of the redesign. And so I want to um, now take some time to address some questions. Mindful of the time, I just want to make sure that questions get answered. So um, Nicole, we can open up the, the floor for questions now. Great. We've actually had a lot of questions come in. Good. So I'll get started um, going in the order that we received them. So they might be chronological based on the PowerPoint. Sure. The first question is from Stephen M. Could you repeat the time periodizations for the redesign? 
Absolutely. So that was back on num uh, slide number four. And these were also in the framework. Um, they're on page 34 of the framework. Um, and so the time periods, again, period one is approximately 1450 to 1648. So 1450 to 1648. Period two is approximately 1648 to 1815. Period three is approximately 1815 to 1914. And then period four is from 1914 to the present. And those, again, are in the framework on page 34. Thank you. The next question is from Marla J. And this was asked during the DBQ rubric slide. Great. Do students need, um, do students need to analyze point of view using all four categories? That's a great question. They only need to use one of those four options. So as long as they have one of those four options, they um, need to analyze POV for each document, but can vary what um, of those four they use. Or sometimes students do the same thing all the time. So they'll just analyze the purpose of the document for every document. Or sometimes they'll just analyze the intended audience. So of those four bullet points there on that slide, they only need one of those, but they need it for all or all but one of the documents. OK. The next question is from Gina B. I see five areas for DBQ rubric. If they are one point each, where are the other two points coming from? That's a great question. And I did not put that on this slide, um, because the rubric itself is in the appendix of the framework. However, um, analysis of historical evidence can get up to three points. One point for the thesis, three points for analysis of historical evidence, one point for analysis of outside examples, one point for contextualization, and one point for synthesis. So the biggest focus is on the analysis of historical evidence, and that will um, be up to three points. In order to get the three points, students need to accurately analyze all or all but one document and accurately analyze point of view in all or all but one document. And um, again, those rubrics are in the appendix of the framework. The next question is from Gia J. If the LEQ is out of six points, which categories on the rubric are more than one point each? Great question again. So that is on that next slide for document num or for uh, slide number seven. And so the LEQ, um, the extra, the, the points, the area where there are more points is the application of the targeted historical thinking skill. So that gets more of an emphasis than the other um, areas as well. Okay. The next question is from Marla J. For the SAQ, I thought I heard that A, B, and C should be addressed in one paragraph. Is that correct? Do they get points deducted for answering A, B, and C separately? No, they do not get points deducted for doing that. And that is, um, uh, yes, that's on that slide uh, right there. I have found for my students it is easier for them to write a paragraph because they are more likely to explain their ideas rather than just list them. If they list A, B, and C and then have a sentence after A, a sentence after B, a sentence after C, there is a chance that they won't actually explain their ideas. Whereas if they write a paragraph, they, they have a propensity to explain. So there isn't a set guideline as of now. However, I feel that the paragraph is a better way to um, have student expression. 
and they have shown samples for the U.S. history exam, and those samples are paragraphs that they have shown uh, for students. Okay. We have about 13 questions left. Okay. Um, and there are still more coming in, so I just wanted to give you a quick update. Sure. Um, the next question is from Steve H. On the DVQ rubric, the slide said use all or all but one document. Can yes. students get some rubric points for using less than all or all but one as they can on the U.S. History DVQ? Yes. Uh, the rubric is exactly the same as the U.S. DVQ. So students can get two points if they use a majority of the documents and address POV in a majority of the documents. So you need to have a majority of both analysis and POV to get two points. Anything less than a majority will be one point. So there is a variation. It is the exact same rubric. And so that's a great opportunity to collaborate with the U.S. history teacher, and then in the future, the world history teacher, if you offer that as well, you all will, will be using the same rubric. The next one is from Alex V. In the DBQ rubric, connecting to outside info later events could potentially kill two birds with one stone. Contextualization and synthesis on the rubric, if I'm remembering correctly. There is some nuance to those points that is still being elaborated on in the rubric. So this is what the new redesign is going to be looking at carefully. There, there's What I tell my students is the more the better. So you will find slight overlap with synthesis and contextualization. You might find some overlap with use of historical examples and historical context for the POV. So students need to work to find uh, ways to um, have as much good information as they can so that the readers can have um, options of what things can count for. So you do have uh, some double dipping that may occur, but you really want to encourage your students to just be as elaborate as possible in connecting these ideas. So it's, it's encouraging students to create a well-crafted essay that puts the topic in context and illustrates that the student understands the time period with examples. So my next question is from James C. For the short answer questions, are there four questions with each part, A, B, and C? Typically, they are. Um, they, the College Board has had um, an emphasis on three different um, tasks that students need to complete. So yes, they, they do all typically have three parts. Okay. The next question is from Patrick T. For the DBQ, the slide said that each document needs to be connected to a historical example. Could you elaborate a little on that requirement? How is that different from historical context? So that's a great question. It's, it's a way, so if we take a look at um, slide six, I believe, is the, um, the DBQ rubric. And so this is a way um, that I just kind of mentioned about um, giving as much information as possible. So when my students annotate the documents during the prep um, annotation period, they summarize the document, uh, they analyze POV, and they connect it to outside examples. An outside example is a more specific historical context. So the DBQ sample was about absolutism. So a historical context might be philosophes at the time challenged the ideas of absolutism. But a specific example would say, uh, for example, Voltaire was critical of the religious control that the monarch had or, or something like that. So historical context gives you an overview of the time period. The historical example is a name, a place, an event. 
something specific that illustrates that historical context. So students can give that overview of context, but they need specific examples from the time period to get that outside example point. Great. Um, we've actually gotten this question from a this next question from a few people. Okay. Where can teachers get resources such as test banks, sample DBQs, LAQs, SAQs? Will these be provided by the College Board, or is there any other place to get them? That's a great question. Um, so, first of all, there is the redesigned test bank that I have been working on with Bedford that directly connects to uh, the McKay textbook. So personally, I would recommend that as a starting point. That should be rolling out this summer. And then the College Board will release sample questions throughout the year through the AP Audit website. So it will be a secure site. So for US history, we received um, sample questions throughout the year going along with the time periods. Um, but you can definitely get a jump start uh, through Bedford's before the summer is out with uh, the redesigned test bank? That was going to be my answer. Thank you. Um, <laughs> the, the next question, I know you, you answered it while answering a few questions, but it's, it's a quick one, and a couple people were asking it. Could you just repeat where the rubrics are found for all of the sample questions? So the rubrics for um, the essays uh, should be found in the appendix. And if they are not in the appendix for this European history framework, they are definitely in the appendix for the AP US history framework. Um, and then uh, the College Board also on their website um, at AP Central has a place to um, look for uh, what has changed. And then there's some things that are highlighted there. Okay. The next question is from Alex B. I like the short answer bell ringer idea, but finding, but creating one for each class is a daunting task. Does a publisher have a workbook full of these to sell, or what other resources can I use? That's a great question, and I don't do these every class period, um, but I do them before unit tests. So um, I have other questions of the day that are not um, SAQ specific on other days. Um, but there's definitely, uh, there will be um, sample SAQs that are part of the redesigned test bank that Bedford's will be releasing. Um, so there will be some resources there. And teachers can also uh, create their own utilizing the language and the wording of existing samples as well. Um, but the resources are ongoing and continuing to develop as uh, the redesign gets rolled out. The next question is from Susan B. I just finished teaching the new AP US course, and there are many similarities. On the DDQ, can you gain support for argument points if you do not have a thesis, i.e., if each body paragraph has an argument? Yes, you can. The language of the rubric um, refers to thesis slash argument. And so you can get some of the points for analyzing all of the documents and POV, even if you don't have a thesis, but you do have an argument. And so my students um, ran into that situation if they simply restated the question. They could not get the thesis point, but they could get some of the other points for analysis. And so yes, you will find that scoring DBQs and LEQs is exactly the way that you have scored for the redesigned US. Uh, the content is different, obviously, but the overall scoring is the exact same. The next question is from Lindsay K. While the periodization begins at 1450, would you suggest still starting 1350 to 1450? I was previously encouraged to give important background information. Yes, that's a great question. It is important to focus first and foremost on the framework. And so in the key concept outline, the very first key concept 
describes the, the world view of European intellectuals shifted from one based on ecclesiastical and classical authority to one based primarily on inquiry and observation of the natural world. And so what I would recommend that you do is look at your existing um, background unit, the late Middle Ages, the Black Death that maybe we focused on, and see to what extent it connects to that first key concept. That's going to be a, a way to maybe refocus what you do in that background unit. Um, as I saw with the US history exam, what is in the framework is testable. So as much as possible, you want to connect your existing curriculum to the specific key concepts so that students have exposure to those ideas. So look at what you do and make sure that it connects to the framework. The next question is from Jeffrey M. Do you recommend taking a training seminar or APSI workshop um, for the new course? I would recommend that if you have um, the opportunity to do so. Um, because it will give you the opportunity to look carefully at the rubrics, um, to think about um, how to score essays differently than you have in the past, um, and to have some time um, to look at those key concepts and think about your existing curriculum. So those are dedicated spaces to think about those changes. Um, if, if you don't have time or you don't have the resources, you can still definitely be fine. But I think that anything that you can do above and beyond is always helpful. And these rubrics are different than we've seen in the past. So it is important to become familiar and focus on how to incorporate them into your classrooms. Um, the next question is from Jeff H. It looks like AP Euro now parallels A push in terms of scoring and expectations. Is this the case? Yes, this is the case. And this is what the College Board has focused on. So World will also be on this as well. And so it gives students a more consistent pathway and set of skills that all history classes incorporate that are AP. And so I think there are exciting collaborative opportunities with the US teachers to talk about scoring essays. Um, even though there is different content, there's definitely opportunities to talk about the same historical thinking skills. The next question is from Ralph R. I'm actually going to combine this with another question we got since it's similar. Sure. From Gia J. So the questions are, to what degree will new textbooks reflect course changes? Will existing and older books still work? What book would you recommend? And then a lot of people were asking if we were issuing a new edition of History of Western Society, the McKay textbook, for the redesign. Mm -hmm. And I can speak to our plans for that. We are not doing a redesigned textbook. The 11th edition is still pretty new. Mm -hmm. And we feel that it really does fit well with the AP European redesign framework. Mm -hmm. But Michelle, I'm sure you know a little bit more about that, so I'll let you speak to that. Absolutely. Um, European history has historically been designed thematically to begin with. And textbooks tend to be organized both thematically and chronologically. Um, so I have found that um, the existing textbooks are, are definitely usable. It is, of course, the um, resources and the test generators um, that are, are new. And so that's an opportunity to get some of those new resources while keeping your existing textbook. And the textbooks themselves cover those thematic learning objectives. And um, that, I think, is, is um, exciting that you don't have to throw out the stuff that you've had. It's incorporating some of the redesigned um, testing and language that could be modified. But the existing textbooks are, are definitely usable. Um, the next question is from David L. How many students are in your class? How are you able to grade that much writing when you're giving a test? And what advice do you have for grading all of the new writing that's required? That is a great question. Next year, I'm actually increasing to two sections of Euro. 
but I do have four sections of APUS, and that had approximately 70 students, uh, 70 to 75 students. And so there is a lot of grading every two weeks, um, but I was very focused on grading one class while the next class was taking the test. So I would get tests during second hour. I would try to grade some of those during third hour. The short answer questions um, can be graded pretty quickly on that three-point scale. And then the LEQs and the DBQs, um, I created uh, rubrics that I would circle key aspects as I saw them. So every time they used a document, I would circle the document number. Every time they analyzed POV, I would circle the document number for POV. And so the rubric helped score the essays more quickly. I would highly recommend applying to the reading. Uh, going to the reading was a great way for me to be able to score more efficiently um, and focus my scoring. I do not write a lot of comments. Uh, the rubric has the comments built into the rubric. So when I circle things, uh, students are very aware of what they missed um, because it says so in the rubric. So the rubrics help um, with more efficient grading. And the next question is from David T. For LEQs, and I'm sorry, I, I don't remember if we'd asked this one before. Uh -huh. For LEQs, what is the difference between explaining continuity and change and explaining periodization? That's a great question. Um, periodization is sometimes referred to as a turning point, and it specifically is asking students to think, to what extent was this a turning point? So for example, the European Industrial Revolution. Um, to what extent was the Industrial Revolution a turning point for the middle class? And the continuity and change over time questions are more long term and don't necessarily have a point of, of turning. So the continuity and change over time question might ask for analyze continuities and changes over time regarding class identity from the age of absolutism to the end of the 19th century. So the middle class that's part of the um, so English Civil War and parliamentary power is not necessarily the same middle class that become factory owners. And so there's, there's a change over time with what is the middle class versus the periodization of question that might ask, when did the middle class come into existence? Was it during this industrial revolution? So there's a, a variation in um, the skill that the student is being asked. The next question is from Alex B. Would you recommend topic sentences? I don't really see anything on the rubrics for things like focus and organization. Those are not skills that are specifically measured on the rubric. They definitely enhance the essay and make it more sophisticated. Um, but that might help with um, contextualization, transitioning between paragraphs to show their connection. Um, it could focus on synthesis of making a, a more sophisticated thesis statement. Um, but these skills that are tested are more analytical, historical skills rather than grammatical. So those grammatical things are not necessarily measured. The next question is from Susan S. I'm really concerned about creating the multiple choice questions. Do you have any more suggestions? What I would recommend is finding a stimulus that you like or that you um, know that your students can reflect on, and then using the language of the framework to help create your distractors. As I mentioned, that there's um, political, economic, cultural concepts in the framework, in these key concepts, and um, utilizing those as your starting point. So for example, if you do go back to the uh, slide that had the Cecil Rhodes political cartoon, so that would be on um, that one right there. So that all four of those distractors are directly from the framework. 
And you'll notice that they all talk about economic or uh, religious motivations. And so um, it takes some time to go through the framework, but that's one way to do it. Um, of course, uh, purchasing a test generator is an easy way to do that. Um, I've done the work for you and have gone through that framework, and so there's a great variety of um, existing questions in test generators, too. Okay, I think we're down to the last two questions. Um, so the second slide question is from Alex B. I get the sense that teaching all of these new skills and rubric requirements is going to require a great deal of class time, and something's got to give elsewhere. What topics might you recommend cutting or abbreviating? Just teaching one example for the new monarchs instead of all of them, one revolution of 1848 instead of all of them, etc. That is a great question, and I don't have a definitive answer for that other than really just trying to focus on those key ideas. Um, I do even like his uh, suggestion or her suggestion of uh, you know, focusing on one new monarch in class, but then having um, an LEQ about new monarchs in which students maybe have um, read other sources about the other new monarchs and then incorporate those into an essay. Um, I do have um, some key debates that I do in class, uh, but the debates are connected to concepts in the key in the framework. Uh, for example, we don't recreate the Concert of Vienna or, or the Congress of Vienna or the Concert of Europe. Um, we analyze it, but we don't role play that. So I've I've kind of pulled back on some of the role playing activities, but refocused the energy in um, comparing and contrasting. And there's a way to kind of consolidate some of those topics into comparisons back and forth that reinforce both time periods without having to spend extra time on them. You're, you're kind of analyzing them as you go. Um, and that's actually something that the summer institutes might be better suited to talk about um, with some of the pacing. And our last question is from Susan B. How and where can we obtain a new a hard copy of the new framework, or is it online only? Um, it is, I believe, online only. I have printed it out, but I believe it's online only. Um, you can go to AP Central and see under the resources if there is a way to um, get a hard copy. They used to hand out hard copies at conferences, but I believe um, now that they're mostly digital. And that was our last question. Um, if anyone else has any more questions that they think of after the webinar, please feel free to email me, Nicole Desiato, and I will forward your email to Michelle um, for her to answer. I also want to mention that in our invitation, we did say that for attending the webinar, you will be sent samples of the redesigned test bank. So we will be sending sample questions from our new test bank that's coming out within a few weeks. Um, I will send them when I send the recording, which will be sent within the next few days. So thank you guys all for attending and um, spending your evening with us. Thank you very much.